Hey, praise the Lord, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and here we are once again with the Cutting It Right Bible Study. I'm once again coming to you with a word for your heart and for your soul. We pray that all is well with you once again as we come to you opening up the Word of God. We are streaming right now live over Facebook and YouTube and Spreaker.com, amen? So we pray that you will grab your Bible, pull up a chair, uh, get your smart device, do what you have to do, but join us tonight because we have a very, very hot topic. That hot topic is the Christian and sin. The Christian and sin, it's a hot topic because it's a topic uh, that is not much discussed uh, in the Christian world. Most of uh, many in the Christian world are now talking about the blessings of being in Christ, which there are countless blessings. Uh, There's a lot of praise and worship, a lot of music, but no one gets right down to the nitty gritty. What is the Christian's relationship with sin? And we do have, in Christ, we do have a new relationship with sin. However... There are those times in the Christian's life where sin does come in, where sin does try to take over and dominate, such as the nature of sin. So what does the Christian do with sin in their life? And that's our topic for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to continue tonight, and we will continue probably also next week. Amen? So once again, grab your Bible, grab your smart device, and join us tonight. Amen. We're going to get underway with all of this right after this. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. We are back. Amen. And once again, we are ready to get underway with this powerful study tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for getting uh, us together here. Lord, we pray that you will draw those who need to hear this word to this place on the World Wide Web. Uh, Lord, I pray uh, that your word will go forth in power. Lord, we know that it is it is a sensitive subject, uh, but Lord, we pray that your spirit might be with us. Lord, give us clarity of mind and heart even as your word goes forth. Lord, have your way. Draw us, anoint us, encourage us, enlighten us, convict us, encourage us. Lord, do what only your word can do. Lord, have your way with us even tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you, Charity. God bless you. Good evening to you. Amen. All right. Now, if you were with us last time, or if you weren't with us last time, we usually like to, we usually like to start out in these lessons with a short review, very short review, just just an overview of uh, what we uh, previously discussed. And on last week, we were talking about uh, how does sin affect us? How does sin affect us? And we're going to be going into that area uh, once again tonight. Uh, but there were seven things, seven things that we brought forth last time we got together, uh, seven things talking about how sin affects us. Let's go through these. Uh, Real quick, if we can. Number one, we said that sin robs you of your joy. Sin robs you of your joy. Man, that's very important to remember. Secondly, we said that sin robs you of your peace. It robs you of your peace. If there's no joy, there's no strength. If there's no strength, there's no peace. So sin robs you of your peace. Thirdly, uh, we said that sin will hinder your fellowship with God. Absolutely. You don't want to be where God is when there is sin uh, lodged in your life. And we're talking about unrepentant sin, not just sin in general. We're talking about unrepentant sin, sin that you have not confessed. Yes, uh, the child of God can come into that area where they do not confess their sins. And this type of behavior, not confessing, not repenting your sins, sin will hinder your fellowship with God. Amen. Next, we said that sin will quench and grieve 
the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life. There is so much that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and for us. But when we are holding on to sin, the Spirit will not, the Spirit will not work in us as he desires. It He prevents it. Our sin prevents that from happening. Amen. It quenches. That means it, it throws water on the Spirit's activity and it grieves the Spirit, which is simply to sadden him. So that's very important to remember. Next, uh, we said that sin will cause God to turn a deaf ear to our prayers. Sin will cause God to turn a deaf ear to our prayers. Scripture says in the book of Isaiah uh, that it is our sin uh, that is that God is not a uh, God is not a uh, hard of hearing in so many words, uh, and it's our sin that has caused the separation between ourselves and God. So sin is definitely going to cause God. Uh, to turn his back on our prayers. Uh, he is under no obligation uh, to attend to our prayers when we are living in willful sin. Amen. Next, we said that sin will cause Bible study to become unfruitful. Sin causes Bible study to become unfruitful. Uh, Bible study is supposed to be a satisfying time. It's supposed to be a time where we are learning and studying and receiving from the Lord. But when we are in the midst of a sinful trial uh, in our lives, uh, Bible study does not and will not have the same impact. Once again, it goes back to uh, the previous reason is because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not be active as he should. And when, we reading the, when we're reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit, uh, his presence is paramount. He's the one who opens the eyes of our hearts that we can see and understand what scripture says. Finally, we said that sin brings reproach on Christ the church, and the Bible. And this is very important. When we don't uh, have a, when we don't have a, a proper uh, lifestyle before the world uh, and we allow sin to run rampant in our lives, uh, it does something to our testimony. And the world, the church, and Christ himself, uh, we cause these three uh, to be brought into question. People will say, aha, look, you see, you see, church is not right. You see, you see, the Bible is not true. You see, you see, Jesus is not all he says. So once, once again, that's what our sin will do as the world sees it. Man, we know that the Lord will forgive and he will cleanse, but that's not how the world is thinking. So we must, we must step up our conduct before the world. Amen. So that was what we talked about uh, last time. Uh, tonight, I want to give you four more. These four, if I can, if I can categorize them, these four reasons, uh, these four things will also affect, uh, will show us how sin affects our life. And these are more serious. If I can, you know, dealing with the Holy Ghost and all the things that we just said are very, very serious. But these four, I, I have to say that these four things are a level, just a level higher uh, in their importance and the devastation and damage that they will do to the Christian life. Amen. Uh, number, uh, number one, number one, sin will bring chastisement from God. Sin will bring chastisement from God. We read from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 and Let's start in verse number five. We'll go down to verse number seven. It says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It goes on to say in verse seven, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? We are his sons and daughters, of course. Uh, and there, there does come a time in our life because of our own behavior, our own selfish, selfishness, our own sin, that the Lord needs to chasten us. Now, how he goes about chastening us is all personal. How he does it is his business, of course. Sometimes we may we may realize that we are being chastened, and other times we may not truly realize that we are being chastened. 
but God will chasten us and he does it not because he's angry and he's coming down on us and I'll show you, you'll never do that again. No, no, it's because of love. He reproves, he rebukes those that he loves. When your child does not do right, you can't stand by and allow that child to run rampant and do whatever uh, they please. You must step in and you must reprove and you must rebuke. And so this is the lesson that we're learning here. Yes, there are times when we are uh, chastened, but we are not to become discouraged in that because we should always know that God has our best interests at heart every time. We go to Revelation chapter number three. In verse number 19, Christ's words uh, to the church at Laodicea, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And that he's saying, listen, I'm rebuking you. I'm, uh, he, he told, if you read the, if you read, uh, the letter to the La uh, Laodiceans, uh, Christ had nothing positive, if I can use that word. He had nothing good to say about this church. He had something good to say about the other ones. Uh, but he had nothing good to say about the church at Laodicea because they were totally blinded to their own condition. Pride had taken over and they thought that they were something that they were not. And Christ had to step in and say, you're poor, blind, miserable, and naked, and you don't know it. I'm rebuking you. And he had to step in. So sometimes the Lord will have to tell us about ourselves in order for us to turn ourselves around. Amen. And it's all out of love. Amen. All out of love. And let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number five. There's an interesting case study in 1 Corinthians chapter number five. I'll first read from chapter uh, verses four and five. It says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, this is Paul speaking, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was addressing a very, very difficult situation that had come up in the church at Corinth. In chapter 5 and verse number 1, uh, uh, Paul states that there was a man who was sleeping with his father's wife. That was his stepmother. There was a young man who was sleeping with his stepmother. And rather than the church be grieved over this and step in and say something or do something about it, the Bible says that they didn't do anything. They didn't respond properly. And here is the, here is the ruling. Here is the command of the Lord through Paul that what should be done about this individual. Um, he says simply, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Hand him over. In other words, allow the devil to discipline him. God would, for a season, take his hand off of him and allow Satan to have his way with him in, in God's own limitations. In God's own limitations. And what that means only God knows, but he allowed this to happen. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, he was going to be chastised. Maybe there were going to be some physical things that were going to happen to him. Maybe there were going to be some things, we talked about this chastisement uh, previously, some things were going to happen in his life. We, we don't know what it is, it is exactly that he means by this, but he would allow Satan to take advantage of this individual because of his uh, non-desire to stop living the way he was living. But look what he says. Deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That means his, his, his body here. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All of this that takes place, God is not saying here that he's sending this man to hell for doing what he is doing. And I'm going to punish him by throwing him into hell. That's not what God is saying here. He's saying that he is allowing Satan to have his way with him uh, for a season and so that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ. In other words, allow Satan to have his way, bring this young man to his mercy, to God's mercy, let the man call on God and God will re receive him and forgive him and cleanse him. And the man can go on and continue living out 
his life in the way that he should be living his life. And heaven is his home. And so that's what is being stated here. But once again, unrepented sin is going to bring chastisement from God. Amen? Unrepented sin is going to bring chastisement from God. And that's so very important to remember. Amen? Now, <clears throat> here is another here's another case that we see here uh, in 1 Corinthians. Once again, Paul addressing the same church. He was addressing something else that was taking place there concerning when they came together for their love feasts. And love feasts is, in our language, we're talking about communion. When they came together to, to, to break the Lord's body, to, to show the Lord's death to they come, as he says here. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, uh, starting in verse number 29. It says, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself or damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Now, what's going on in these verses? Uh, here uh, in these verses, uh, we see Paul once again addressing the manner of, the manner of communion. People were coming together at these love feasts the way they did it then, and they were taking of the food and the drink, uh, but some of them were not living right. They were just just taking it all in for themselves. Uh, he says there's a certain there's a certain way that we are to take communion as the people of God. Okay, there's a certain way we have to understand what we are doing. If we don't understand what we're doing. We should not partake if we have ongoing sin in our life. I didn't say, I didn't say uh, uh, sin that you that you you're struggling with sin or you, Lord forgive me, cleanse me of my sin. That's fine. That's fine. We all sin and we say Lord forgive me. That should not prevent you from taking communion. I'm talking about an ongoing habitual uh, lifestyle that is just becoming. Becoming a stronghold, becoming ingrained, something that you are not bringing to the Lord. That type of sin, you should not take communion. You should not take communion. And here's what he says. When this happens, he who eats and drink in an unworthy manner. In other words, in a matter, in a matter uh, when they are not worthy. Because I am living in sin, that makes me unworthy. In an unworthy manner. If we, we, when we do this, we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. Judgment. We, we cause God to have to judge us. And that's what we said here. Uh, um, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. We should judge ourselves before God judges us. Okay? It's best for us to see ourselves, look at ourselves, be honest, and say, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, make me whole, help me, and you can go right ahead. But once again, God knows the heart. And if you say that prayer knowing full well that you're going to step back in to that sinful place, then I would not partake. I would not partake. Um, he says here, what happens is when we don't discern the Lord's body. In other words, when we do not properly recognize the Lord's body, talking about uh, the symbols of the of the bread and the wine or the bread and the juice. Um, many are weak and sickly and many sleep. That's the judgment. Weakness, spiritual, physical weakness. He says sickness in your body. And he said many sleep. That's death. That's the ultimate. That's the ultimate chastisement from God for sin. Death. And I'm sure, if it says it here, I'm sure it has happened many times over that we don't even know of. And it's not important that we know, but I'm sure it has happened, man. So that's very important. Uh, it's important that we judge ourselves before we step in and take communion, amen. All right, second, uh, thirdly, uh, thirdly, uh, Something here. Sorry, one second. All right. 
sin opens us up. Sin opens us up to Satan's deception. Sin opens us up to Satan's deception. Now, when we talk about uh, when we talk about Satan's deception, when we talk about Satan's deception, um, let's look at Peter's life. Peter walked with God, communed, walked with the Lord, communed with the Lord, spoke with Him. He was there with them. He was part of the inner circle. Uh, Peter, James, and John. But all of that did not prevent him from sinning. All of that did not prevent him from being proud and stuck up. And he became deceived. He was deceived by his own pride. Just like Satan was. He was deceived by the fact that he was Peter and he walked with the Lord. And he he just thought that he could not fall. Lord, I will never. Lord, I will go with you to the end. Lord, I will die. That was Peter's thought. that He truly believed it. But he was deceived. He was deceived. And so when we are living... Uh, in that type of deception, then we open ourselves up for further deception. Satan sees the opportunity and he will die then if he can. Wherever Satan sees an opening, he is going to try and do damage. He will come in subtly, he will come in slowly, but he will do what he can However he can, however he is allowed to. I have to always say however he is allowed to, because what do we say? Satan is not a free agent, not at all. He cannot and he does not operate on his own prerogative. I'm going to do this because I can. I'm going to do this because I feel like it. That's not how Satan works. He can't work that way. He is under the sovereign, uh, the sovereign control of God himself. He cannot do whatever he pleases. Always keep that in mind. That is something that he does not want to hear, but it is nonetheless absolutely true. It is absolutely true. Next, sin will prevent you from fully entering in to kingdom blessing. Sin is going to prevent you from entering in to kingdom blessing. That's very important to remember. God wants to bless his people. He wants to bless his people. Uh, the book of uh, Peter, in the book of First Peter, we read just a little bit uh, about uh, the blessings uh, that the Lord has already given us. And these blessings are just some of the blessings that he wants to lavish upon us. Uh, Second Peter, I'm sorry. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, as his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything that we need to live out this life, we have it. He has given it to us. But when sin comes in, when sin comes in, these blessings become blurred to us and we're not able to receive them. We're not able to grab a hold of them because sin is in the camp. Sin is in the body. Sin is in the life. So we must rid ourselves of sin. To life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption, the corruption that is in the world through lust. So all of this is ours. We just need to receive it. We just, it's ours. But once again, sin blurs that picture and everything, and what we want to do, uh, many times we wind up not doing. Uh, and it's all because of what sin will do to every Christian life. Every Christian life, sin will have a terrible effect. Amen? Finally, finally, and this is most serious, most serious, all right? Unrepentant sin can cause you to lose your life. Unrepentant sin 
can cause you to lose your life. Now, this is actually a bit controversial. We don't mean to be controversial here, but this is a bit this is a bit controversial. Uh, because there are those who believe that once saved, always saved. There are those who believe that you cannot lose, uh, that you can lose your salvation. And so these two, uh, these two mindsets, these two beliefs uh, come to clash on, on this particular, on this particular point right here. Uh, it can cause you to lose your life. Now, what do we mean by lose your life? The Bible talks about that there is a sin unto death uh, in First John. Uh, in the book of 1 John, uh, it talks about the sin unto death. The Bible clearly states in 1 John that there is a sin unto death. Now, what is the sin unto death? Is it a specific sin? Is it drinking, smoking, lying, cheating, stealing, fornication, adult? Is it a specific sin? A sin unto death. It's talking about a sin. Is it, some say it's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Can a Christian blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I don't think so. I don't believe so. I'm not in that camp. I don't believe that a Christian can blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Uh, so what is this particular sin unto death? Some say we don't know what this sin is. I don't know what it 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 is. It is a you are at a place where God knows and no one else knows. God knows the heart. So the sin unto death can be anything. Okay. And then we read the book of Hebrews that says that they could not, the people of God, could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief is the sin, the sin that sends unbelievers to hell. Unbelief. It is not lying, cheating, stealing, smoking, fornication, all of these different sins. These sins do not, that is not why people go to hell. Not at all. People go to hell because they have not believed on the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's why people who are not saved, if they die in that condition, will go to hell. They have not received Christ. So, when it comes to this sin unto death, the sin unto death can be equated to unbelief. Unbelief. Now, how can a Christian come to that place of unbelief? How is that possible? I don't know how that's possible. Once again, I'm not I'm, I'm not a theologian. I'm very, very far from being a theologian. I would like to say that I'm a student of scripture, but I'm not a theologian. And how a Christian can come to that place where they don't believe. They just say, you know what? I don't believe anymore. If that can happen, it can happen. If it can't happen, it can't happen. But the point is, there is a sin unto death that leads to death. And that leads me to believe that it has to be unbelief. Unbelief is a sin that leads to death. For the saved, for rather for the unsaved, and possibly for the saved. So, there you have it. There you have it. Uh, we read, uh, there once again, there are some who believe that when Christians blaspheme the Holy Ghost, that... They can't be forgiven for that, and it's a sin unto death. Once again, I'm not in that camp that believes that a Christian can commit the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is simply speaking evil of the Holy Ghost. Speaking evil of the Holy Ghost. And if you ever have thought that you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost, that is, that is proof that you have not. If you are afraid that you have, you have not. Because if you have, if someone has blasphemed the Holy Ghost, they would not care. They would not care in the slightest bit. But the very fact that someone is worrying and wondering, I, I hope I didn't, or maybe I did, you did not. You did not. Amen. So that's very important to remember. So, unrepentant sin can cause you to lose your life. Okay? And that's very, very important. All right. Now, let me say as we get ready to uh, step into a, um, a another topic here, um, let me just say hi to Cairo and Mark and France. God bless you. 
Uh, God bless you. Thank you for joining us on tonight. Amen. Now, with all of this concerning sin that we've been talking about, how do you deal with sin? How do you deal with sin in your life? Because all have sinned and come short of God's glory. All of us sin. I didn't say we do it intentionally or on purpose. I can't wait to sin. Oh boy. I, I didn't say that kind of sin. But what do you do with sin in your life? What have you done when sin has tried to overtake you? Because if you're a child of God, sin has tried to overtake you at one time or another. That's once again, that's the nature of sin. Sin wants you. Sin means to have you. The Bible says that sin shall not have dominion over us. That tells us, that indicates that sin wants to have dominion over us. But it cannot. When our faith is properly placed in Christ, sin cannot have dominion over us. And that's that's a key word. Have dominion. Putting your faith properly in Christ and the finished work does not abolish the desire to sin. It does not abolish sin completely. Sin will not have dominion over you and I when our faith is properly placed in Christ and his finished work. So important to remember. So let me, for the next few minutes, before we close, let me give you four ways that we are not to handle sin. Four ways that we are not to handle sin. Amen? Number one, Willpower is not the solution to sin. Willpower. Saying to yourself, I think I can, I think I can. I promise I'm not going to do that again. I, I, I won't, I won't, I won't. All, 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 listen, your will has a place in your life. Your will, Okay does have a place in your life but you cannot will yourself to victory over sin that is something that cannot be done you cannot will yourself to victory over sin christ has won the victory it's already done willpower willpower is not the way man it's not the way secondly Asceticism is not the solution to sin. What do we mean by asceticism? Asceticism is simply the practice of self-denial in an attempt to grow closer to God. Let me give you some examples of asceticism. Uh, fasting. Uh, celibacy. Refraining, one, refraining oneself from sex if you're married that is poverty flagellation that is whipping yourself beating yourself self-mutilation wearing simple or uncomfortable clothing laying on pieces of burlap all of these things smell of asceticism and and the bible does not tell us to go in that direction asceticism no we are not to beat ourselves and mutilate ourselves into some sort of holy submission uh monasticism uh is something that asceticism is comes from monasticism and we have monks and and different groups that put themselves uh away from society they take vows of celibacy and some take vows of silence uh, where they won't speak and they and they walk around sad looking and and this is not the way the see that's once again that's deception do we really think that this is what the lord has called for us to do to keep ourselves from sinning to put ourselves in a monastery far away from man woman boy or girl so we can have some sort of holiness and 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 god in our lives no that's that's not god's way that is that is demonic. I'm going to call it demonic deception. 
that people would even believe that way. I didn't say they're possessed. I said it is deception of the highest order to believe that by doing these types of things, God is saying, good job. Good job. Keep it up. Keep beating yourself. Keep mutilating yourself. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. And, and something like fasting. Listen, fasting is, fa there's nothing wrong with fasting. Who's going to say something's wrong with fasting? Fasting is biblical. Fasting is biblical. But once again, if you believe that by fasting enough time, fasting enough days for 21 days or 40 days or whatever, how many days you want to do to once again, prevent or keep yourself from sinning in a particular way, you got to be careful about that. You got to be careful about that completely uh, because that is not, that is not how the Lord uh, would have us uh, to live. As Charity says here, uh, she says, uh, submit, uh, submit yourselves uh, to God. Submit yourselves to God, uh, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Sin's temptation is from the devil. Amen? So very important. And that's so true. That's so very true. So we must not allow, uh, we must not allow uh, these uh, these false teachings and, uh, and false doctrines uh, to overtake us. Because that's what, we, that's what they will do. Uh, these false messages and false teachings, uh, they will overtake us if we allow them to. So asceticism, asceticism is not of God. He has not called us to live a life uh, that way. Once again, the case of, of fasting, we are not against fasting. Of course, we fast when the Lord calls us to fast. We fast for various reasons. So sometimes we're looking for an answer to prayer. Once again, it's all... As the Lord directs us to do so, we do so. But we're not trying to fast just so I'm going to fast. So when I'm off this fast, I'm going to be free and clear. I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to be have victory. I'm going to be set free. Be very careful. Be very careful. I can probably tell you stories of people that put themselves in a whatever how many day fast and came out and were the same people. The same people, nothing changed, nothing changed, okay? So once again, be very careful. Uh, some people would say that they're going to fast from television or fast from this thing or that thing. Biblically speaking, and I understand the whole mindset of saying that, fasting from something, the whole, the word fast in the Bible has to do with food. So if you want to, if you want to uh, simply uh, surrender certain things in your life and, and give up certain things or sacrifice certain things in your life, that's fine. Uh, but fasting is food. Fasting is food. We fast from food. So we don't, really, biblically speaking, biblically, I'm talking about biblically, we do not fast from other things. It's a very popular thought and idea. But uh, fasting is all about food, all right? Fasting for food, uh, for the purposes of drawing closer to God in some type of way or whatever how, way uh, that the Lord has called you to do, amen? So that's very important. That's very important uh, to uh, remember, all right? We're talking about uh, how you should not handle sin. And here we go. Here we go. Praying harder and fasting longer. We just finished talking about fasting. Praying harder and fasting longer are not the solution to sin. Praying longer and praying harder and fasting longer are not the solution to sin. I see where a charity says uh, that she uh, she eats one meal a day. That's 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 fine. That's fine. I very rarely eat I very rarely eat breakfast at all. Very rarely eat breakfast. I didn't eat breakfast today. Uh it's just something that I do. It's just something that is normal. So that that's that's fine. Uh but once again, praying harder and fasting longer is not the solution to sin. So you're telling me that I shouldn't pray? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not telling you should shouldn't pray. Of course. Of course, we ought to pray. We ought to pray like never before, like never before. 
But he, here's the thing. I can remember people coming to me in years past, in years past, and asking me, uh, young people or, or people in between, just people, I'm having a struggle with this. I'm having a problem with this, and I don't know what to do. I've done this. I've tried this. And all I personally was able to tell them, because it's all I knew, because it's all that I would do myself, is to tell them, you know what? You, you gotta, you gotta stay in there. You just gotta pray harder. You know what I'm saying? You got, you, you, you just, you, you just gotta try harder. Pray harder. I mean, that's, that's not it. It's not about praying harder. I didn't say don't pray. Once again, don't get me wrong when I say pray harder. It, 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 what does that mean to pray harder? To make sure you cry tears when you, to make sure you shout when you pray, to show God that you really are serious. What does it mean to pray harder? Okay, so once again, it's not about praying harder that's going to be the solution to sin. I can remember, I can remember uh, when I was in a backslidden state, a backslidden state at one point in my life years ago. Uh, and I went up to the altar and I prayed the quietest, most humble prayer that I could pray. Once again, I was living away from God and I just simply said something like, Lord, help me. I remember saying that it was so dark. Lord, help me. I didn't shout. I didn't holler. Nothing wrong with shouting and hollering. If, that, if Listen, if that's what you do and God is in it, then praise the Lord. But I didn't shout. I didn't, I didn't scream. I didn't jump. I didn't dance. I didn't, I just said, Lord, I need you. Help me, Lord. Fix me. Cleanse me. And it was that quiet. It was quieter than that. It was almost at a whisper because I didn't feel I didn't feel worthy to come before God. But he heard me and he changed my life around. Oh my goodness. He saw the heart. He saw the heart. He, he, didn't, he didn't hear my volume. He didn't see my emotions. He didn't see what I did. It was just me saying, Lord, I need you. And he heard the cry of my heart. And he blessed me. And he blessed me. And that's what God did does so that's what i'm saying praying harder not praying at all not not praying at all that's ridiculous but praying harder and fasting longer if i fast for 30 days god's gonna bless me more if i fast for 40 days god is gonna bless me more if i fast for 50 days god is gonna really come through for me well, maybe i'm not saying what god can't do not at all i'm not that guy that's gonna tell you god will never do that all I'm saying is if you put your faith in your action, then you're putting your faith in the wrong place. Don't put your faith in the fact that you have prayed a bunch of days and God is supposed to come through for you. Don't put your faith in the fact that you've been praying hard for such a long time and God has to come through. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Where is your faith? Keep on praying. Go ahead. Keep on fasting. Go ahead. Keep on reading your Bible. Go ahead. But where is your faith? Don't put your faith in your activity. Well, I come to church every day. I come to church every day, every night. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. And, and what? What does that mean? What does it mean? Okay? So don't put your faith in your activity. That's all that we're saying. All right? Finally, finally, all right, performing an abundance of good works is not the solution to sin. This is so very important. Performing an abundance of works is not the solution to sin. I probably told you this before, uh, but I'll say one more time because it applies here. Uh, I spoke to someone years past, years years ago. They were a pastor. This this person was a pastor, and uh, I said, "Hey, I said, hey, you you you're not staying in one place. You gotta you gotta slow down. You you you're going here. You're going there. What are you doing? What are you doing?" And and the person and the person informed me uh, that the more that they the more that they ministered. The more that they worked, the more that they served, 
that it kept sin down. It keeps sin away. Now, I didn't know much about what I'm talking about now. I, did, I didn't know much, much about uh, what, I, what I speak about now these days, these years, over these years. But I knew when I heard that, that didn't sound right. You don't keep working hard to keep sin down. Now, maybe I don't know how to live for God neither at that particular time, but I'm just going to keep on chopping away, working hard, running myself to death, and I'm going to keep going, and that's going to stop sin from happening in my life? No, it's not. Because once again, you're placing your faith in your works. And when you place your faith in your works, you are, you are creating a law. Your works become your law. It's not the Mosaic law, but your works become law. And when law enters into the picture, uh, law, de law deceives you. Law deceives you and sin opens up. It opens up. It's the old rule. It's the old rule of the, uh, of the keep off the grass that I always talk about. Uh, seeing that grass, the, it says, do not enter. The first thing you do when you see the sign that says, do not enter, you want to get in there. When I saw the sign, keep off the grass as a little child, I stepped in. Don't tell me I can't do it. And that's how law works. We create laws and, and, and we create laws and then we create laws on top of laws. Before you know it, the point is that what happens is that our performance, we are placing our faith in our performance. Without realizing, without recognizing it, we must not place our faith in what we do. We place our faith in what Christ has already done. It's not do, do, do. Go, go, go. Gotta, gotta, gotta. It's Christ has done the work. He died for me. He procured. He, he took my place. And now he won the victory over Satan. So I don't need, I don't need to struggle over this thing. I don't need to struggle over this thing. I don't need to struggle over this sin in my life. I don't need to struggle about this thing that I can't seem to get a handle on in my life. I don't need to struggle with it. I need to come to the understanding that Christ died for it and I am victorious already. It's not a mind game. It's not a mind game. He won the victory. I'm in him. I am in Christ. Therefore, I am also in victory. I have to see myself as victorious. And when Satan dangles that sin or that behavior or that activity in front of you, you are able to simply say, through the cross of Jesus Christ, I don't need to do such a thing. By the cross, I am free. By the cross, I am victorious. By the cross, I have been set free. And once we come to that understanding, once we come to that knowledge, once again, sin will not have dominion over us. Okay? Dominion. Understand what, understand what I've been trying to say. Sin will not have dominion. When Satan realizes that you have found the answer to sin in your life, when he realizes that you now know that the way to keep him at bay is by keeping your faith in Christ's finished work, which cut him down, he will now attack. He will now attack. The greatest faith you can have is faith in Christ and his finished work. That's the greatest faith you can have. Great, great and great faith must be tested greatly. Great faith must be tested tested greatly. So yes, you found the answer to sin. It is Christ and his finished work. Now, Satan is going to go to work. Satan is going to try to make you eat your words. He's going to try to make you uh, not comply. He's going to do all he can to steal what uh, the, the victory that you have. He'll do all he can all that he is allowed to do. I have to watch when I say all he can because once again, he just cannot just haul off and do whatever he feels like because 
I'm the devil and I, I have it like that. No, he doesn't have it like that. He can do whatever he wants. But when he knows that you know how to defeat him, mm, that's bad news for him. That's bad news for him. It is by faith in Christ and his finished work. Doesn't make you perfect. Doesn't mean you won't be tempted. Doesn't mean you won't fall. It doesn't mean that. It means that sin will not have a vice grip on your life. It means that sin will not be that thing in your life that you just can't control. Because for too long, Christians don't have not addressed this issue of sin. We'd like to believe that because we're in Christ, everything is under control. Those who are Pentecostal believe that all we have to do is just speak in tongues and the devil will flee and that's all we have to do. That's not the case. That's not the case. Nothing wrong with speaking in tongues, of course. But that's not the answer also. We didn't put it here, but that's not the answer to sin in your life. Speaking in tongues. Just, just no, it's not. There's a purpose for speaking in tongues. There's an order in speaking in tongues. But to uh, give you victory over sin, that's not the purpose of speaking in tongues. Faith in Christ and his finished work. Where is your faith? What do you do with your sin? Amen. So very important. Keep Christ as the object of your faith. I want to pray. Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your people. Lord, we thank you for those who have come around your word tonight to hear your word uh lord we lord we know that some of the things that are spoken may be some things that are a little bit foreign to some of us uh some who are listening and watching but lord we have been convinced that the answer to the sin problem in the christian life is the cross lord by your blood you set us free and lord because of what you did we now still stand and walk in victory so, Lord, have your way in our hearts, have your way in our lives. Lord, we give ourselves totally to you. We place our faith in your finished work. It is finished. There's nothing I can do to add to it. Lord, I bless you and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Mark. God bless you, Jemima. God bless you, Jemima. So good to see you. Um, Cairo, God bless you. Uh, God bless you, France, and and Charity. God bless you all. Uh, thank you for being with us. Now, if you're watching over Facebook, uh, don't forget to share out this page, if you will, just to make sure that others who may need to hear this word will be able to hear it. Amen. I don't know all the people that you know, and each one of us don't know the people that we each other know. Uh, so just pass it along, uh, so that everyone can get a a heaping helping of the word of God. Amen. That's all we desire. We're not trying to go viral ourselves. I'm not trying to make a name for myself. That's for sure. I just want the word of God to go out. And if I can cause the word of God to go viral, then that's good. That's good. Okay. It's all about the word of God. Amen. So we just bless him and we thank him for what he is doing. Amen. Well, I invite you back here with us on Sunday morning, Sunday morning at 11.30 a.m., or you can catch the replay. I know Sunday mornings uh, are, everyone can't be here live, I understand that. Uh, but join us as we continue our series, The Strong Tower. Uh, we had a powerful word on this past Sunday with the Lord. We really sensed the Lord's presence as we were speaking, and uh, uh, I pray that you will be able to join us uh, tomorrow, uh, rather on Sunday morning, at 11.30 as we continue our series, amen? Monday night, uh, Monday night, the book of Matthew, the Line by Line podcast, we're going through the word of God, one verse at a time. We are in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter number five, discussing the Sermon on the Mount. So be with us if you can, this coming Monday night at seven o'clock p.m. And on Tuesday night, Tuesday night, we're continuing our series entitled Lighting the Darkness, Understanding Our Role as Children of Light. Amen. So we pray that it will be a powerful time once again in the Word of God. And next week, once again, we'll come to you with another session 
of our first principles of the Christian life on the Cutting It Right Bible study. Amen. So we just bless the Lord. We thank him for all that he is doing. Uh, we know that God is on the move. We ask for your prayers as we continue uh, bringing forth uh, the word of God. We are in the process of writing our second book. So pray for us as we continue to to do so. We're coming along and uh, we're just allowing the Lord to uh, speak to us and have his way as we get this done. Amen. So pray for us on that, on that respect. Amen. Uh, don't forget that you can go to our website uh, and leave us your email address. Then we will send you a copy of uh, our latest newsletter, letting you know what's going on in the ministry. Uh, also, don't forget to follow us on social media. You can go to our Facebook page, which is That's the Word Ministry, and follow us. And you can also go to our YouTube channel and become a subscriber if you have not done so already. Amen. While you're at our website, you can download a free copy of our ebook entitled uh, Remaining Unmovable, Seven Keys to Quality Longevity in Christ. Amen. And as we spoke about our book, we have written also a book uh, entitled The Lights in the Windows, Eight Basic and Powerful Principles on Evangelism. It is available on Amazon.com. You go to our website, there is a link there that you can follow that will take you there. Amen. So we pray that you have been blessed and it's so good to be with you and we are going to tap out tonight and we pray that the Lord has been gracious to you and we will see you the next time. May God bless you.